A warm Wednesday midweek welcome to you, whether you're here in the tent, whether you're in one of our relay venues or joining us online. Grace, hope and peace to you in our Lord Jesus Christ and may he keep you looking to him over the course of this convention week. We'd love to hear how this week is blessing you. Please do continue to use hashtag KESCON 2023 to keep in touch with us via social media. As we now sit, as we gather, let's bow our heads and pray together. Our great God and Father, we praise you. There is nothing lacking in your perfection. Nothing escapes the rule of your Son, Jesus. Today we ask, show us more of your gracious kindness. Call us on in our walking in the footsteps that lead after your Son. Guide and equip us always to call upon his name. May our praises please you, our obedience honour you, our trust magnify your wisdom, your glory, your greatness. In Jesus' name, amen. And now let's stand and sing his praises together. Two years ago, um, when we... Um, we, we were here at the convention. We had a very special moment when the restrictions were lifted and congregational singing was allowed once again. And we sang this song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And we thought how faithful God had been to us through a very difficult season. And yet, two years on, we think again how faithful God has been to us through this year with the highs and the lows, with the joys and the sorrows that sing of his faithfulness as we stand. i 
seated. As we think of God's faithfulness to us today, some notices about events happening around our convention site today and tomorrow. Christians in the workplace, a chance to meet up if you work in the public sector to discuss the challenges and opportunities, the encouragements that face you in your experience at work as a Christian. That's this afternoon, 1.15 to 2.15 in the Pencil Factory in Room 101. Perhaps you've not been inside the Pencil Factory yet this week. In that case, you might want to join the Pencil Factory Open Hour. Look inside the Pencil Factory. It'll be open for an hour from 2 o'clock today. No tickets are necessary. Just head over to the Pencil Factory reception and you'll be shown round from there. There's an afternoon tea for those who've got families who are mission partners living overseas. Sign up at the reception. That's today, 3 o'clock until 5 o'clock. Later on tonight, after our evening celebration, Colin and Phil will be giving us a concert uh, here in the main tent. Do stay on for that and enjoy that time together as well. Looking ahead to tomorrow... There's going to be a lunchtime gathering for foster carers and for anyone else who's interested in fostering. That's tomorrow, Thursday, in the Base Camp Cafe between 1 and 2. Please do bring your lunch and drinks and a sweet treat will be provided. From those treats now to digital treats, as James Robson tells us a bit about our digital resources. Can I be stored on a memory stick? Am I beautiful? I don't answer that question. <laughs> What's so amazing about race? One of the things we do, as you know, we talked yesterday about Keswick Ministries being more than just a convention. There are teaching and training events. We also produce some different digital resources. I'd love to tell you just a bit about some of those. The first is uh, the uh, Keswick Convention podcast. Eight they're really programmed, interviews with different speakers from this year's convention, 
tackling questions like the ones I started with today. They're free, available, you can explore different areas that we've, uh, say, talked about this week from a slightly different angle with Jam Carey, Rachel Redeemed, and Matt Holden hosting. They're really interesting, engaging, informative, and take you deeper in a different angle into these subjects. We also produce the Kez Talks podcast. That's for uh, talks where you can catch up in a podcast if you're jogging or going for a walk or in the car or whatever, to access talks from this year's convention, all available for free, or from previous year's convention, the Kez Talks podcast. We also want to make available, because we're all one in Christ Jesus, we want to make things available for free, just as the gospel is free, the material on our YouTube channel. So it's both live streamed and available for catch up. So this year and last year and so on. And if you thought, I really wish I could have gone to that seminar, but I can't be in two places at once, the seminars will be available for catch up afterwards. Go to our Keswick Convention YouTube channel. We also have a talks library on our website. That is for the last 10 years of Bible readings and evening celebration talks. You can access those. There's a search bar where you can look if you want to catch up on a talk from a previous convention. And then you may be saying, oh, these are all fantastic. I love those. What I'd really like to get is a convenient and comprehensive way of accessing everything either from this week or from the whole convention. And if so, you can order and you'd need to buy these um, USB sticks or downloadable files where you can access all the talks from this year's convention. I say you can get them all for free, but if you want something comprehensive and convenient, you can give away, then either head to reception, there's a form there, or online. So many things to whet your appetite, so you can take this convention with you wherever you go. Thank you. We're almost at time for our Bible reading, joined on stage by Sue Barclay. Sue teaches at All Nations Christian College and is one of our seminar presenters over the next couple of days, Thursday and Friday. Sue, welcome here. Thank you. Before I pray, before you read, before Jonathan comes and speaks to us, can you tell us a little bit about your seminars, engaging our spiritual neighbours and our post-Christian neighbours? What are you going to be covering? Yes, yeah, so I want to start by considering who are our neighbours? What do we know about them? What kind of people are they? What does it mean that we are those who live amongst them? And how can we engage them in a meaningful way? And we're going to be recognising that some have a spirituality, even though they may not be religious, and others want to say they have no spirituality at all. Mm. So that's tomorrow, Thursday and Friday. Thursday and Friday, yes. Lovely. Please come along. Thank you very much. Let's pray for our hearing and our receiving of God's Word. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth and light and life of your Word. Thank you for what Sue is going to read to us as powerful words from you. Thank you that through your Word, the Lord Jesus comes to us clothed in the promises and commands of Scripture. Please be with Sue in her reading with Jonathan in his teaching, with us as we listen, as we hear. Please help us to feed. Please help us to be satisfied. Please help us to go from here empowered to live for Jesus. In his name, amen. Amen. So our reading comes from Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 15. Therefore... As you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. 
And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Amen. Thank you, Sue, for reading for us so well, and a special word of thanks to those of you who have reached out to me since yesterday to let me know that you felt that uh, yesterday's exposition was comprehensive. (laughs) Appreciated that very, very much. I've now made it a point of policy that I will receive all such feedback of that kind as being positive in nature, so thank you very much indeed. It's been lovely uh, getting to know various folks and catching up with various friends around the site and around the town. And I, I have sensed and I have heard that many have come to Keswick this week in need of refreshment. I think that's many of us here, isn't it? Many have come a little bit weary, a little bit worn, maybe a little bit discouraged. And I hope that your experience like mine is that being among brothers and sisters in Christ is doing good for your soul. I trust that your experience, like mine, is that singing the praises of our Savior is stirring your heart and doing you good. And I trust that in looking to the Lord Jesus Christ in the pages of His Word, you are meeting with Him afresh and being renewed in spirit. That's our hope and our trust and our confidence as we come to the Word of God that we will meet with the living God and we will see our Savior and be refreshed in Him. Colossians 2 and the passage that was read for us, I don't know if you've ever gone on a very long hike, perhaps over many days and many weeks. Perhaps that's part of the holiday program for you here in the lakes. Maybe some have walked the Appalachian Trail or the Pennine Way or the Tahoe Rim. Maybe you've taken on a mountain range somewhere at some point in your life, a portion of the Alps or even the great hike to the Everest Base Camp. Perhaps you have a dream or an ambition to tackle a great trail in the months or the years to come. And and on a journey like that, on a long walk like that, it is essential, isn't it, that you begin prepared to go the distance. If you are going to make it all the way to your planned destination, if you are going to persevere, if you are going to endure, there are certain things you are going to need to be sure that you have. Space is limited in the pack you carry, but you need to know that you've got the essentials with you. Food, water, the correct clothes, the navigation aids. With with them, you'll be well equipped to thrive on the journey and to arrive at your destination. Without them, well, your very survival is in doubt. In our passage today, the Apostle Paul is concerned to equip you and to equip me for the long walk of the Christian life. He wants us to be ready for a hike of endurance, and he wants us not only to survive, but through the experience to thrive and to grow. Notice with me his heart's desire, verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. As we've seen already this week, and as we're going to see again today, Paul is aware that the Colossian Christians face pressures, pressures that could undermine their progress in their faith, pressures that could disrupt their pilgrimage. False teachers are in their midst, 
and their influence threatens the journey of these believers. And Paul wants to warn them, verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. There are those who are peddling philosophy, lies, human traditions, and worldly religion. And their influence is a threat to the Colossian believers as they seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Their influence threatens to throw them off track, to discourage them, to confuse them. Now, theories abound concerning the specific nature of the false teaching that was circulating at Colossae. And we should resist, I think, the temptation to say more than the text says to us about it. It seems to me that the Lord has given us just enough insight here to see the broad contours of the problem and to see the general themes of the false teachers and to know that they remain contemporary and they continue to circulate today. But the Lord hasn't given us in his words so much information that we get lost in the weeds of history and in the background of first century religious ideas. The threat facing the Colossians, the potential derailment, the potential mental and spiritual captivity, verse 8, came in the form of philosophy and empty deceit, which followed the contours of human tradition and the elemental spirits, or perhaps better, the elemental principles of the world. And it seems here that Paul has in mind forms of worldly religion, which are always works-based, which are always do-it-yourself in nature, always focused on human achievement. You see, that drive for works-based religion is the devil's favorite lie, It's woven in to this fallen world. It is, if you like, an elemental principle of life in this fallen world. We see it everywhere. World religions across history and around the globe have held out the promise of spiritual success and spiritual acceptance based on good works. It's baked into the fallen world to think this way. None of this, end of verse 8, is according to Christ. It is diametrically opposed to the gospel, which is the glorious message that Christ has achieved our salvation himself, and we don't need to add anything to it because it's all been done. In Colossae, the particular form of this worldly religion evidently had a Jewish flavor to it. There was a risk that these believers would be judged by others on the basis of Jewish religious observances. Just look down to verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. That was the danger, that traditions, rules, and regulations would be imposed upon these believers, that they would be taken captive by a worldly religious outlook that focused on legalistic performance and not on Christ our Savior. And longing for these believers to keep going in their journey and for us to keep going in our journey, to keep walking in Christ established in the faith, Paul reminds us of what we have in Jesus, what we have in Jesus. He reminds us of all the resources we have been given to see us through the Christian life and to bring us safe to glory. And he wants us to see that you and I have been given enough, and more than enough, more than enough to see us through. There is nothing we lack, nothing we need for the journey. Well, friends, what do we have in Christ? What do we have in Him? Well, in Christ, first of all, we have fullness, fullness. That's the first thing that Paul highlights for us, verse 9. For in Him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Do we have enough? Are you and I experiencing true fullness? Do we have sufficient spiritual resources to see us through from here 
and to our heavenly home. With fuel prices edging ever higher over the last few years, the Automobile Association back in Canada has been reporting that it's been called upon more and more often to help stranded motorists who have run out of fuel on the motorway. People are putting in, you know, $20 of fuel and hoping that it's going to get them to their destination, but it just doesn't cut it anymore. They're running on an empty tank, running on fumes, and they find themselves stranded at the, at the roadside. One of the messages evidently coming from the false teachers at Colossae was the message that these Colossian Christians did not have all the spiritual resources they needed for a complete spiritual life. They did not have fullness. In some respect, they were lacking. They needed a top-up in order to know a satisfactory spiritual experience, perhaps even to know salvation in the end. They needed more than Paul's, Paul's gospel had given them. Within their blend, verse 8, of philosophy empty deceit, human tradition, worldly religion. Within that mix, the false teachers insisted that they now had for these believers the added element, the missing piece that would then bring fullness. Now, you and I, we may not encounter the exact same message and the exact same pressures that the Colossians were facing from the false teachers in their day, but we probably are familiar with their modern-day equivalents of worldly philosophies and worldly religion. No doubt you have encountered one such variant, encountered it in religious self-help books, in podcasts, in media, in conversation with others. You know, your, your, your Christianity's okay, you're told. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine to focus on the Word trust in the promises of God and so on. That's a good thing to do. But you're, you're missing that added element of spiritual experience. And let me tell you, if you will take up a, a particular kind of religious practice or experience a particular kind of worship or discipline yourself in a particular kind of way, deny yourself this or give this much money or go on this particular retreat, then you are going to have the added element that you are currently missing in your spiritual life. You are going to have, let me tell you, fullness. Ever heard that? Ever received that message? Your Christianity is okay, but it is not complete. And I have for you the missing piece. But of course, the offer of fullness doesn't simply come to us from skewed misrepresentations of Christianity. It comes in the form of the other religions and philosophies of the age. Notice again the language of the warning in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Perhaps most pressingly today, as I reflect on this, perhaps most pressingly today, the alternative offer of fullness comes to us in the form of the great new social and philosophical movements that have swept through the West in recent years. Ideas and movements demanding radical change to our view of what it means to be a human being demanding radical change to our anthropology, demanding radical change to our worldview, or indeed to the prevailing social order. Movements seeking to right the wrongs of the past experienced by various historically oppressed groups. We're familiar with the movements. Now, these diverse and overlapping movements, which bear various labels in various places, some helpful, some unhelpful. Wokeism, of course, being the most popular. These varied movements in some ways now constitute the dominant religion of our age. The, these are religious movements, at least in some respects. Consider that with me just for a moment. Within these movements, there is a sense of, a fixed sense of right and wrong, of good and evil. There is a definite hope of self-justification through doing certain things and embracing certain things. There are acts of homage that must be paid 
raise a flag, attend a celebration, there is quite a concrete picture of what salvation and utopia will look like. There is a profoundly religious zeal for the realization of the movement's goals. Now, these varied and overlapping movements are generally marked by a desire for individual and corporate justice. Individuals are to be given freedom to self-actualize, to live their authentic selves. Historically oppressed groups are to experience restitutive justice of various kinds. And, and the promise is this, the hope that is held out is this, if these goals are realized, we will enter into a very bright future as a totally new kind of society. Now, I don't intend to undertake an analysis of these movements. I wouldn't be competent to do it. But the movements are familiar enough to us all by now. I won't attempt to assess their, the validity or otherwise of the concerns that may underlie them. No doubt we can trace some understandable concerns that have given rise to them. I mean only to observe this. I mean only to observe that they have power and influence in our society today. The energy behind them is zealous. The hopes attached to them are fervent and ambitious. The commitment to them on the part of many is uncompromising. And certainly in a place like Canada, where we live, we are seeing society being rapidly restructured around their aims and their values. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that these are the movements of thought and belief that now define our age. They are, I would propose, contemporary expressions of, verse 8, human philosophy and very often empty deceit. They are an influential set, aren't they, of human traditions, a significant contemporary manifestation of the elemental principles of this fallen world. And crucial to our discussion now, adherence to these movements would no doubt tell us that fullness is found on the personal level and on the corporate level in the actualization of these dreams for a new society. Build this society. Enjoy this freedom. Live out this authenticity. Experience this justice. And that's going to be it. That will be fullness. Isn't that the promise? Isn't that the hope? Come here and find fullness, competing voices tell us. F find it in this add-on to Christianity. Find it in this religious practice. Find it in the pursuit of a new kind of society. And Paul says to each of these voices, and he says to each of us, be very, very careful. See to it. Take care that no one takes you captive by a deception of this kind. You see, if you have believed the apostolic gospel of Jesus Christ, you have all that you need. You have true spiritual fullness. And here's why. If you have believed the apostolic gospel, you have Jesus. And in Jesus, you have the fullness of God. In Him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. We need to be crystal clear, says Paul. There is nothing lacking in Jesus Christ. He is not part God. He is not a mere representative of God. He is not simply a pointer to God or the one who in some way resembles God or speaks of God. He is not lacking in his wisdom, in his insight, in his capacity, in his power. No, in him the fullness of deity dwells bodily. Now, that is, of course, a very remarkable thing. It is a truly miraculous thing. You, you see, many would accept that Jesus Christ speaks some truth about God. Uh, other faiths might even recognize him to be a prophet or a teacher of wisdom. But the idea that in the person of Jesus Christ, the fullness of God dwells, even within a human body, that is a breathtaking thought. You see, our understanding 
of what it means to have spiritual fullness and spiritual completeness. It centers on who Jesus Christ is. It centers on the fact that he himself is the fullness of deity. There is nothing more to be found anywhere else in terms of truth or power or completeness, nothing more in human society, nothing more in all the universe than that which is found in Jesus Christ. Now, having stated that much, Paul continues, verse 10, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. If it isn't breathtaking enough to consider that the deity dwells bodily in Jesus Christ, it is even more breathtaking to consider that this same God now fills us, his people, who belong to him by faith. If we belong to Jesus Christ, if we have repented and believed and know him ourselves, the truth of the matter is this, the God who is the head of all rule and authority in all the universe, the supremely exalted one who became man in Christ Jesus, has come now to indwell us and fill us by his Spirit. The false teachers evidently came along to the Colossians and told them that they still lacked something, to make their spirituality complete. They needed an added extra, a different approach to find true fullness. And and Paul doesn't get down into the sort of mud to quibble over the details of their arguments. He doesn't descend to their level. He rather brushes them aside and calls these believers to turn their eyes toward Christ and to consider the fact that the Christ of deity and of glory and supreme authority now lives within them fullness. They have all the fullness of God in Christ. There is no greater fullness to be found in all the universe than the fullness that belongs to the children of God in Christ. Friends, I wonder, do you ever question whether there is something missing in your spiritual experience? Do you ever wonder if your Christianity is the complete package Do you ever look at others and sense and feel that they have something that you do not have? Do you ever hear the voices of other groups and teachers who would suggest to you that your spirituality is lacking and who would call you to something higher, something greater? Do you ever listen to the philosophers of our age as they cast their vision for human flourishing within a brand new society, a vision that is so often so at odds with the biblical worldview, and You see so many chasing that vision with messianic fervor, and and you look upon that and wonder if they actually have something that maybe you lack, if they have seen something that maybe you have not seen. Here is the truth you need to know and cling to and rejoice in today. Here it is. If you have Jesus Christ, you have all things. If you have the spirit of the living God within you, you have the fullness of God. If you have been filled in him through trusting the Savior, you have been filled indeed. Friends, don't go chasing after the next great spiritual experience or tool or method. Don't go running discontentedly for the impressive sounding thing over there. Turn once again to the Lord Jesus Christ Meet him in his word. Come to him in prayer. Submit your heart to him that he might work in you and through you. Go deeper into the fullness that you have in Christ. I remember as a younger person serving in summer camp ministry, one of the choruses we often sang was, it was such a simple thing, but it taught a truth that we really wanted the children to grasp. Maybe you remember it. All that I need is in Jesus. He satisfies joy he supplies. Life would be worthless without him. All things in Jesus I find. Now, do we really believe that that is so, that we find all things in Christ, that he alone satisfies, that life would be worthless without him? Do we believe that we have fullness in Christ? What do we have in Christ? What have we been given for the journey? First, fullness. Next, life. Life, verse 11. 
In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. Now, these verses can look a little bit complex and just a little bit daunting, but what Paul is essentially saying is, I think, quite straightforward. No doubt the false teachers were pressing upon these believers all different kinds of ritual and rule-keeping as necessary to find spiritual fullness and all the rest. Perhaps they were demanding that the men be circumcised. That seems pretty likely here. And Paul, he's got no time for ritualism and regulation. He doesn't want the Colossians to be taken captive by tradition. And so he says, look, verse 11, if you believe in Christ, you have had a spiritual circumcision where the old you, the flesh, was removed. In Christ, you have made a totally new start. Think about the image of baptism, verse 12. You go down into the water. Peter Baptist, you can, I don't know what you do with that. We, we need to imagine that we're all Baptists here and, and immersion just for a second. You go down into the water, okay? We'll, we'll take that image. And it's like you're being lowered into the grave. You're being buried. And with him, you rise again to new life. That's what God has done in your life if you belong to Jesus Christ. You don't need rite. You don't need ritual. You don't need circumcision or anything else to make a new start. You have been made new in Christ. Through Jesus, God has given you new life. Just consider that for a moment. Consider what's being said. The gift of Jesus is the gift of a fresh start, of new life, of life that endures beyond this world and the world to come. Just let that sink in. For so many in our, our worlds, no doubt for some among us even now, the weight of your personal history, the weight of your regrets, the weight of your failures, of your guilt, it's almost too much to bear. Perhaps you've tried to start fresh countless times and in dozens of ways. You've tried the self-help methods. You've made resolutions and you've made commitments. Perhaps you've tried to move to a new place. You've tried to cut off old relationships and establish new ones, but it's never been the clean break and the fresh start that you've longed for. And the idea of a truly new life and a truly fresh start, you would do anything for that. I guess the closest our world, I was thinking about this, I guess the closest our world can ever come to a totally fresh start is the fresh start offered by police forces in many countries to those who enter, you know, a witness protection program. I gather about 3,000 people in the UK have entered the national program here. New identity, new home, a complete break, a necessary break with the past, but entering witness protection in some ways, it's actually a new form of confinement a new set of restrictions, a loss of relationships, loss of freedom. But the gift of a truly fresh start, of new life, that is the gift that only Jesus can give. It's the gift he gives to those who know him and who trust him. Those who come to him in faith, he makes us new. If you haven't yet come to him for life, for that fresh start, you need to do that. You need to do that. And you can through the gospel, the door is open. And for us who have been given new life, we need to remember the wonder of it. And we've got to remember the joy of it. If we're hankering for more in the Christian life, hankering after some other kind of spiritual experience, we, we need a reminder and we need a reality check. In Christ, we have been given new life itself. The old me has been buried the new me has true life in Christ. And as we're joined to Jesus in this newness of life, we are united with him in his resurrection from the grave. And we are given the promise of life that will not end, even eternal life. In Christ, we have fullness. In Christ, we have life. And very closely linked to that, in Christ, we have forgiveness. Forgiveness. Notice it there with me, verse 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us 
all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Now, the reason that death is even part of our experience in this world is due to sin. Death is the penalty God set for rebellion and for disobedience, and death entered the world because the first human beings chose to live their way rather than God's way. And of course, you and I, we have followed in the footsteps of our first parents in this, but in giving us life, the Lord Jesus has had to deal with our guilt, our sin, God made us alive together with Jesus, having forgiven us all our trespasses. And how did he do that? He canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Within the courtroom of God, there would be for each of us a list of crimes set out before the divine judge. None of us could claim that the list was exaggerated or untrue. We know our our guilt, covetousness, selfishness, idolatry, greed, dishonesty, and on and on the ugly list reads, and it's true. I I had the joy of catching up with one of our church's missionaries just recently who serves in a country where corruption is really very, very rife. To get anything done at any level of government, it's just expected you're going to pay the bribe. The whole system is is rotten, and, and the corruption extends to the court's Records of guilt might just disappear for the right price. A judge might forget or overlook misdeeds with the right connections and the right incentives. Our record of debt, yours and mine, it can be canceled in the courtroom of God, but not through a bribe, not through the right connections, not through favoritism. It can be canceled, but only through full payment for guilt. God is a just judge, and things will be done properly and addressed with integrity in his courtroom. And the wonder of the gospel is that Jesus, a guiltless one, he came and he paid the price of our sin in full when he died on the cross. He dealt with it fully and justice was satisfied. Now, you and I, we all know the experience, the unhappy experience of carrying a burden of guilt. We know what it is to be fully convinced that we are in the wrong, that we have done wrong, that we deserve to face consequences for our wrongdoing. We know what it is to regret that which we have done, to wish for all the world that we had done things differently, but to know with sadness that there is no going back and undoing the past. We know what it is to be aware of our guilt before God. Even those who don't openly acknowledge God have, I believe, this inner sense and awareness of accountability. We know what it is to fear what the future will hold when we are held to account. We know what it is to bear guilt, to labor under the weight of our sin, and a number here, I guess, today will be feeling something of the weight of that. For, for a number, that burden of guilt will actually be a crushing thing at the present time. You may not speak of it. You may try and bury it but the guilt and the weight of sin, it is always there. Now, whether we feel acutely that weight today or whether we remember that weight from days gone by, as we consider the reality of being weighed down by sin, I think we can agree on one thing together. There is no greater gift that any one of us could receive than this, to have the burden of our sin taken away, lifted from our shoulders, never to be placed back upon us. A little while ago, we began reading together John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress in our home. Written in the late 17th century, it's been continually in print for over 300 years. Perhaps it's the most influential Christian book ever written apart from the Bible. We have a a lovely copy of that that was in my grandmother's home in Suffolk, Uh, when she was growing up, I guess, in the 1920s. So it's rather nice to read from that volume to our own children. But the work is really an allegory that tells the story of a pilgrim named Christian who flees the city of destruction and longs to go to the celestial city of light, who struggles in his journey because he is weighed down with a terrible burden on his back, the burden of guilt and of shame because of sin. But after a certain time in his journey, he eventually reaches a place where his situation changes. And and let me allow Bunyan to tell us in his own words. 
Up this way, therefore, did burdened Christian run, but not without great difficulty, because the load on his back. He ran thus till he came at a place somewhat ascending, and upon that place stood a cross, and a little below in the bottom a sepulcher. So I saw in my dream that just as Christian came up to the cross, his burden loosed off his shoulders and fell from his back and began to tumble and so continued to do till it came to the mouth of the sepulcher where it fell in and I saw it no more. Then was Christian glad and lightsome and said with a merry heart, he hath given me rest by his sorrow and life by his death. At the cross, Christian's burden falls away. It falls into the tomb below, never to emerge once more. There is for each one of us a terrible burden to bear, more than we can carry. There, there is a true record of debt that stood against us. It won't do to try and pretend that we're not in the wrong. That's the world's way, isn't it? To alleviate conscience by denying wrongdoing. What you were doing, it wasn't wrong after all. Don't worry about it. That's what the world says. No, we're guilty, all right. But at the cross, God took the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And so it is at the cross that the record of our debt is set aside. It is at the cross that our burden of guilt rolls away. Bunyan, he, he had it right, of course. And the image of the pilgrim being relieved of that great weight and that great load, it's so powerful. Now, I'm just so conscious that there will be two types of people here who really need to hear this today and take it in, to internalize it, to reckon with it, to take hold of it in a fresh way. There will be the believer who has stumbled. There will be the believer who is freshly aware of sin. Of course, we all stumble in many ways. We're all failed and we're all flawed. But maybe you are weighed down by that in a particular way at the present time. You are, you're disappointed with yourself. You are frustrated and you are ashamed. If so, here is the, the truth for you. Here's the truth. Your record of debt, if you've trusted in Jesus, your record of debt was nailed to a wooden cross just outside Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And, and it was paid in full. It was set aside never to be considered again. Your burden has been lifted. Your guilt has been removed. And because of that, friend, let me say today, you may live in freedom. You may live in freedom. There will also be some, perhaps a number among us, who have, who have never truly found forgiveness in Jesus. You've never experienced that. Maybe you've thought you were a Christian and you've gone to church for a long time but you are weighed down by guilt because, quite frankly, you are still carrying that burden of guilt, and it will never leave you until you bring it to Jesus by faith. You will carry that burden all your life if you don't take it to Him, and if you fail to do so, that burden will lead only to death. And for you, the invitation is simply this. Would you come to Him today would you take that burden of guilt to Calvary and allow it to be dealt with there, paid for, set aside in Christ? You can live in true freedom with a clear conscience even today if you will come to him. Will you do that? Will you come to him in simple trust? There is nothing greater that could ever be done for us, no greater experience that we could ever know than the experience of sins forgiven, conscience cleansed, and that is precisely what has been achieved for us and won for us in Christ. Now, remember the bigger context here. The, the false teachers were telling the Colossians that they needed a top-up to get spiritual fullness. Jesus, you know, that's fine. The cross, that's fine. But we need a little bit more for completeness. And Paul is saying, what a terrible lie that is. What a terrible lie. What a blasphemy. 
to suggest that the cross of Jesus is not enough. What more could we hope for and what more could we have? We have been given the forgiveness of sin, the lifting of our burden, the cleansing of our conscience. What more could anyone else ever give to you than that? But still today, there will be those who come along and say to us, you're, you're, you know, your Christianity is okay. <laughs> Maybe a little bit stayed. Maybe it's a little bit limited. But, but, you know, come along with me and I will give you this experience. Maybe some spectacular worship experience. Maybe some legalistic method. Maybe some self-help program. Maybe some offer of health and wealth and material blessing. Whatever it is, come here and I will give you a complete Christianity. I'll give you spiritual fullness. And we must say to such falsehood, no. No. I have come to the cross of Christ, and my burden of guilt has rolled away. You have nothing that you could give me that God has not already given me in Christ. In Christ, we have fullness, we have life, we have forgiveness, and finally, we have victory. Victory, verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. It's not nice for us to think about it, but it's important for us to be aware we have a great spiritual foe who is set against us. Satan is the real and personal enemy of God and of his people. Satan hates God. His ambition is to kill and to destroy. He loves to cause suffering. He does all in his power to keep us from God and to draw us away from eternal life. He has legions of his minions, demons, who do his dirty work throughout the world, and they are dead, set against us. We don't see all their activity, but we feel their effects. They are real, and they are active. C.S. Lewis was right when he suggested that the devil is happy both when people obsess about him and live in fear of him, and then when they barely believe that he exists and pay him no heed at all. He's happy with both those things. Both extremes, they suit him just fine. Well, I don't know if you're someone who ignores him entirely or is fearfully obsessed with him, but in either case, and for all of us, the truth that Paul teaches in verse 15 is a vitally important truth, a vitally important truth to equip us for the Christian life. We need to know that although the devil and his minions are real as enemies of God and of us, they are at the same time disarmed and defeated enemies. And Paul wants us to understand that the point of disarmament and the time of defeat occurred 2,000 years ago. It took place at the cross of Calvary. And we say, well, that's a little bit odd to think of because as Jesus hung dying on a, on a Roman cross as a prisoner of the state and a condemned criminal, it didn't look much like a, a moment of victory. Appearances would have suggested the, the very opposite. But the visual impression in some ways masks the great reality. The cross of Christ represented the decisive defeat of the devil. Well, how so? Consider what the devil has been seeking to do. What has been his great program? The word, word Satan means accuser, and the Bible speaks of Satan as the accuser of the people of God. He incites rebellion against God. He incites sin, as he did all the way back in the Garden of Eden. And having encouraged us to sin, he turns then around with the full force of his fury and with sinister delight, and he points the finger at us and tells us that we are guilty as sin, condemned to hell. That's what he does. And in doing that, Satan has a true power over the guilty. You see, his plan has been tragically effective across the human population and across human history. He has condemned untold numbers of souls to judgment and to hell. But what is the one thing that breaks Satan's hold on any heart and any life? Well, it's simply this, payment for sin, forgiveness within the courtroom of God. And so when Jesus hung upon that cross and paid the price of our debt and our guilt, when he did that, he actually undid Satan's work. He frustrated Satan's plan. He brought Satan to humiliation. In Christ at the cross, God disarmed 
the rulers and the authorities and the evil empire. He took away their ammunition to accuse the people of God. He put Satan and his demons to open shame, triumphing over them in Christ. It's a terrible thing to have a hateful enemy. It's terrible for a nation. It's awful to be at war. It's terrible for an institution. It's terrible for a family. It's terrible for an individual to have an enemy who seeks your harm. And perhaps you know that experience on some level. But Paul would remind us that as the people of God, we have a dreadful enemy, a hateful enemy, an adversary who longs for nothing other than our condemnation and our destruction. We need to be realistic about that. We need to reckon with that truth, but here is the simple good news. Our dreadful foe is also our defeated foe. Our hateful foe is also our humiliated foe. He has been disarmed. He has no more arrows of accusation to fire at us. He may trouble, but he can no longer torment. In Christ, we have been given the victory over Satan himself. And so we, we come back to the question, what, could, what more could we possibly need or want in order to make our spiritual life complete and full? If you've wondered if there's something more, if others would tell you that you need something more, friend, remember again what you have in Christ, all that he has given you, all that he has done for you. And remember once more that in Christ we have all that we need and more to equip us for the journey through this life and to bring us safely to our heavenly home. And you know, that should make us above all things a thankful people, a deeply thankful people. We've received all things in Christ. We have fullness. We have the resources needed to live the Christian life and to complete the journey home. We're not lacking anything. We don't need to look over our shoulder wondering where fullness is to be found. Oh no, in Christ we have it. And so we return thanks to the Father, and we live as a profoundly grateful people, end of verse 7, abounding in thanksgiving. I had a a rather embarrassing uh, moment in Waitrose the other day. Uh, That's one thing we don't have in Canada, by the way. We don't have Waitrose, and it's so so lovely, isn't it? You can go and do your your shopping at Lidl or or Aldi or whatever, and then pop into Waitrose for a top-up of a few... (laughs) Fine provisions, and you buy one of those 30p bags with a little crest on it, the royal crest, and you pop your Aldi shopping in the waitress bag. (laughs) And then you you tot around town, feeling as though all is well throughout the realm (laughs) and the empire, or at least through greater greater Tunbridge Wells. Anyway, I was in Waitrose, and we had, we had needed, we were going to be on the continent, and I needed to get some travel money. And I went to Waitrose to get our travel money, not because I thought the notes would be crisper than the notes from the <laughs> Asda travel desk, but because they were cheaper, their rate was better. So we went in, and we ordered some, some euros, and, and they gave me this lovely package, this envelope with our euros, and I, I walked away from the desk and, and took the euros out and just had a quick count, and, and not everything was there. And I said to the children, look, we're going to have to go, go back. And they, they thought, oh, no, this is going to be so embarrassing. <laughs> you know, dad's going to have to remonstrate with the customer service. And they were just hoping that, you know, the earth would open up beneath them or something. Anyway, I went back to the desk and I began the conversation. You know, I'm so sorry. I, I don't think everything's here. It's a bit embarrassing, but we seem to be short a few euros. And the lady was, you know, supremely polite and delightful, as, as of course, they are in, in Waitrose. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, I then looked back in my envelope, and I discovered that those very crisp Waitrose Euro notes had actually stuck to the envelope in the bottom, and they were there. So I had to make my, I had to make my apology. Maybe that you've been <clears throat> standing at the spiritual customer service desk for a while, claiming to the Lord that something's lacking and that you need more. And friends, maybe your great need this week is actually to look back in the gospel envelope and to know that in Christ we have all things. To look back in the apostolic envelope we received, we first received, and to remember that 
In Christ, we have received fullness and life, forgiveness and victory, and so abound in thanksgiving. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Let's pray together as we conclude. God, our Father, we thank you for all that we have in Jesus. Would you remind us today and lodge in our hearts a memory of all that we have received in him, and having received all things, would you give us daily grace by your Spirit to walk in him and to be those who abound in thanksgiving. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to stand and sing of the one who is absolutely unique, the Lord Jesus. Come behold his wondrous mystery. Shall we stand as we sing?
Our morning meeting is almost to the close. A few minutes remain to us. Just to say on your way out, there's copies of EN newspaper with a special wraparound, including articles by convention speakers and details of a discount that's possible for you. But free copies of EN on the way out. Our prayer team remains available to you if the fullness of Christ is something you want to recover or receive, be confirmed in for the first time or for another time, then please move if you're in our venue towards the right after the close of our meeting. As we come now to the close of our meeting, let's consider our baptism. We heard about it in our reading. Your baptism, whenever it was, that fullness in Christ, the pledge of a life lived for him. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, may your kingdom come. May it embrace all things in Christ. Thank you for fullness in Jesus, for justice in him, for authenticity, for all in the body of Christ. In every area of life, of our humanity, church and society, please we pray for it to find its fullness in Jesus, in the gospel, in deeds, in fruit, in keeping with repentance. Nothing lacking, nothing excluded, all things submitted to Christ. Please help us in the light of the word we have received from you to find our place with rejoicing in him. Amen. May the day be blessed to each and every one of you.